Are we there? Yeehaw, we got it to work. That is cool. Thank you for your help back there. Uh, I'd like for us to begin, as I say, with those four things in mind. That being the case, we'll begin our study of Revelations chapter 12 and 14 this morning. I'd like for us to dig into the text, but before we do, I promised the men that I would tell you beforehand that the things I share this morning are my opinion. I believe that it's the most logical explanation for what I read in the book of Revelation and how things are going to unfold. But you need to understand it's my understanding of Revelation and you have responsibility to open up the Bible and study the book of Revelation for yourselves as well so that you can develop your opinion. I will tell you up front, this is going to seem a bit strange to some of you. And that is okay because it's what I believe is going to unfold as I've studied this in depth now for around 40 years and really in depth for the last several months. Um, with that as a background so that you know that this is my opinion, we'll continue on this day as we examine what I've titled part two, what is to come. Part two, or what is to come part two. We want to introduce in this particular passage some personages. You know what I mean by that? It's like, it, it's looking at Queen Elizabeth, or it's looking at, uh, think of some other famous person. Uh, I'm afraid to use political things today. It's like scary. You, know, you just pick one. You know, it, it's like looking at them and saying, well, that's like, or this is like, or I look at that, that piano and I say, that is like a grand piano only smaller. You, you know, it's, it's that kind of a thing. You're trying to, to use something to describe something else. They're symbolic personages. It's a symbol of something even bigger or even greater. In Revelations chapter 12, 13, and 14, the beginning of it there, the main figures of the Great Tribulation, which is that period of time we all dread, are introduced to us and described to us with some picturesque words. The first sign comes in the form of a, of a female. And it's not just a female, it is a female that is described to us in celestial terms. She's the first figure that we're going to need to unpack in order to gain an understanding of this section of scripture that's dealing with this whole period of tribulation. She's described, you know what I mean by celestial terms? What is celestial? It's like the, the things in outer space, the things that are up here above, it's like the stars, the moons, the skies. All those things are going to be used to describe this woman. It says this woman is clothed with the sun. The moon is under her feet. And on her head, there's a garland of 12 stars. I mean, that's quite the picture. That's quite the picture indeed. Let's take a few moments to break down and examine these personages, beginning with this woman that's described for us here in Revelation. Now, hopefully you have read chapters uh, 12, 13, and just the first part of 14, then what, what it says in the bulletin, that's, that's actually for next week. It says it's for the day, but it's actually for August 1st, the reading that's inside of there. Now, here goes. This is my understanding. I believe that the woman being described with these celestial terms represents the nation of Israel. That's what I believe, and, and I'll explain why. The fact that John says this woman is a sign helps us to understand that the woman stands for something else. It's not just a woman that's there that looks weird. It's not a literal woman, so to speak. The woman clothed with the sun, according to many Old Testament passages, would point us directly to the nation of Israel. Now, Israel is often represented as a woman, so this wouldn't be a far stretch at all. If you want to look those up, you can look in Isaiah 54, 1 to 6, or Jeremiah 3, 20, Ezekiel 16, 8 to 14. You can look those up on your own, or you can get out your concordance and go down through. Israel is described over and over again as a woman, so this is not a far stretch at all. This woman, Israel, gives birth to a son. Now, if you've read this in advance, you kind of see how everything's unfolding here as we look at the text and as we begin to examine it and come up with some explanation of how it all fits together. As we unpack this passage, it becomes clear that this child born to this woman, this child born to the nation of Israel, is someone we've come to know as Jesus. 
It's pretty cool to watch it unfold. We're told in Revelation 12, 5, that the male child she bears will rule all the nations with a rod of iron, a scepter of iron. Have you ever heard that before? In direct relationship to Jesus Christ. It's kind of cool to see how all this begins to unfold as the pieces come together. After this woman is described and we come to understand her as the nation of Israel and we see Jesus as the child born of Israel through Mary, Next, he describes this dragon for us. The dragon, I believe, represents Satan, who has both political and religious beast doing his bidding. Now, those beasts are going to come a little bit later, but he introduces the dragon first. He says, there is this dragon here. And then he describes the, the dragon. He says, it's fearful. It's powerful. It's fiery, red. It's a satanic dragon having seven heads, ten horns, seven diadems on his head. You getting the picture? This thing's scary. But once again, it's a symbol of something else. The fact that John refers to this dragon that gives power to the two other beasts, it lets us know it's not just a little dragon. It's a figurative dragon that's able to give power, to distribute power. This is something bigger than just a dragon. In fact, I think the descriptive term of the fiery red dragon points to the nature and the character of the thing that John is describing. And the thing that makes the most sense to me for this vivid description of this dragon and the fact that it wields this force, this fierce power, and that it possesses a murderous nature. I, I think the thing that makes the most sense is that John is painting a word picture of pure evil. Can you think of anyone that you've ever heard of who is pure evil? Satan himself. I think the, the dragon is representative of Satan. The seven diadems on his head suggest that this force has great power. Satan has great power. He lays claim to royal authority. He wants to be something special. He wants to sit on the throne in heaven. He wants to take over, but it's just a presumptive claim. He really isn't going to be able to do it. His authority stands in stark opposition to the true king of kings and to the true Lord of lords. You have to understand how all this is unfolding. All this is coming together. He wants to be considered a king, but in reality, he's just a big, powerful, self-seeking, egotistical bully. That's what Satan has been. A liar, an egotistical bully, willing to say whatever he's got to say to get what he wants. That has been Satan from the very beginning of time. And as we look at this picture of the end of time, he is still actively involved. This satanic force is bent on destroying the earth and all those who occupy the earth. He wants to do us in once for all. This dragon or Satan stood before the woman who was ready to give birth, I believe, to Jesus. He's waiting to devour the child as soon as it was born. I mean, he's got everything in place. He knows he's coming. He thinks he's got this under control. He uses his tail to draw a third of the stars of heaven to earth to stand with him. And the thing that makes the most sense to me there, and that I would suggest to you, is that the stars represent the fallen angelic host, or demons, if you will, because they've turned their back on God and joined forces with Satan himself. They are a league of demonic forces, demonic Things that are involved with Satan during the end of times to try and bring this whole world to its knees to worship Satan himself. He's sending out these minions, these demons, during the end of time to do his bidding. Now, Satan is going to stand in stark opposition to this child from the moment he is born to the nation of Israel. When Mary gives birth to Jesus, from the very beginning, Satan tries to take him out. Remember what happened? Remember how that Herod sent people to kill all of the babies who were born in Bethlehem? But how God had purposefully provided for him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh to sustain them as he sent them off to the land of Egypt, the place prepared for him. I believe that the man-child that John describes here represents that baby Jesus. 
The nation of Israel, through Mary, gave birth to a male child who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. Are you starting to see how it all unfolds? And I think the thing that gives it the sinker for me, that, that drives the nail home, is that it says eventually her child was caught up to God and his throne. Remember when Jesus gave his life on Calvary? His death, his burial, his resurrection. He spent time with his disciples and then they watched him ascend to heaven to be with his heavenly father. I think realistically it's safe to say that the nation of Israel through Mary give birth to baby Jesus and Satan's out to get him. That's the picture being painted. That's the, the thing that John is trying to reveal to us. By now it's becoming increasingly clear that this child unmistakably is Jesus. The fact that he rules with a rod of iron clarifies it even more. You can count on it. We're told in Psalms 2.9 and Revelation 9.15, he rules with a rod of iron. The woman and her child had to flee in order to escape the forces of this dragon. He you imagine you're running for your life? But God has provided a way. They head to the place prepared by God where they'd be cared for. And when the time was right, God brought them home, but Satan never gave up. Throughout Jesus' entire life, Satan continued to hound him, to attack him, to stand against him, until ultimately, Jesus finally allowed him to take his life as he spread his arms and died on the cross of Calvary. The picture is being painted for us in Revelation. It's helping us to see how this whole theme of time runs together. Remember, someone, someone is coming. Someone has come. And that someone is coming again. It's all being laid out so that we can grasp it if we put the effort into understanding what's being said here. The angel that John describes represents Michael, the head of the angelic host. He's going to do battle with the forces of Satan, with all of his minions. Michael and the angelic host go to war with this wicked dragon and the forces that he command, that he brought down with him, with his tail. In essence, he brought these angelic beings that turned their back on God and decided to follow him to earth to wreak havoc. That's what's going on in the picture here. The dragon and his host, they fought valiantly, but they lost. And they get themselves permanently kicked out of heaven. Now, this is a huge battle between good and evil, if you will. But it's even more than that. In the end, the evil dragon was cast out and his angels or demons were cast out with him. And through all of that, with these angels being brought down, the earth finds itself infiltrated by Satan and his evil minions. Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection made it so that the devil went to work in a big way to do what he wanted to get done. He wants to literally take out the people of God. It's comforting to know this. If he brought a third of the angels with him, how many are still left in heaven on God's side? So two to one, right? That's pretty good odds. It's like two to one. In essence, I, I'm really glad that there's more that stayed with God and that are fighting on our side than there is on the demon side, on the devil side. Once the battle ended, though, there's a voice that speaks from heaven. And that voice shares these words. It says, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down and they overcome him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth. Did you get that? That should be scaring us to death. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows he has a short time. When he gets kicked out of heaven, he gets sent down to earth. He is just plain ticked off. Wow. In essence, this battle between the forces of good and evil was a battle for the very souls of men. For your soul and for my soul. Heaven rejoices in the victory. They're happy. We have defeated Satan. Once for all, he's been kicked out. Jesus rose triumphant. He's, he's got power over sin and death. But as heaven rejoices, God makes it clear it's going to be rough for us down here for a while. 
For heaven's gain ends up being earth's loss. A great woe is declared and directed at the inhabitants of the earth and the inhabitants of the sea. Satan knows his time is short. He knows that he's beaten. And like a wounded animal, a wounded cornered animal, he begins to fight ferociously. Fight for everything that he's worth. The rest of the woman's offspring that he goes after, that John describes, that represents the Gentiles who come to faith. Jews first, and then the Gentiles. We're told that the dragon was enraged with the woman, Israel, and that he went to make war with her, and it says the rest of his offspring, and that, my friends, is talking about you and me. This dragon was really ticked off. And he decides to go after Israel and the rest of her offspring, Gentile believers. That's us. The devil is after you and he's after me. And I can tell you, I feel that on a daily basis. That was part of our Sunday school class this morning as we tried to answer the question, what happens whenever sin comes at you again and again and you fall to the same sin over and over again? How do you deal with that? How do you see? For That's the devil at work trying to bring us down. The wrath of the dragon is clearly focused against God's chosen people, whether they're Jews or whether they're Gentiles. He's going after them both in a huge way. <coughs> These two groups are the targets of Satan and the targets of the Antichrist persecution during the last days. And I believe now more than ever, we are in those times as we sit here in this building today. And I'm going to tell you why as we go down through here and you're going to think I'm crazy and that's okay. People have that, they, they've thought that of me before about 10, 15 years ago. I started telling about the evils of Islam. Nobody believed me, but I'm telling you it's true. All those who would not submit to or worship this great satanic power are persecuted to the death. This is not a little thing. They're persecuted to the death. Satan realizes that he's lost the battle for the soul, so he begins to physically persecute them with the assumed goal of stifling their witness by weakening their resolve. Did you get that? He wants to stifle our witness by weakening our resolve. Then comes another personage, the beast out of the sea. John describes this beast as one who will stand in opposition to Christ and do his utmost to destroy the followers of Jesus. The dragon, the devil, stood on the sand of the sea waiting for the beast's appearance, knowing that the beast was on its way, anticipating what was coming next. He knew what was about to unfold. That's what's so interesting about this is not only does God know, but Satan knows and he's orchestrating it, thinking that he was going to win, just like he orchestrated the death of Jesus, thinking he was going to win. <laughs> but friends, God is in control. John tells us that this beast emerges from the sea. The beast resembled a leopard, but had feet like those of a bear and a mouth like that of a lion. If you overlay this with Daniel's prophecy, you see four kingdoms represented in that. You see the lion representing Babylon. You see the bear representing Medo-Persia. You see the leopard representing Greece and the dragon representing Satan and his powers as they are wielded in the city of Rome. The sea that the beast comes out of, I don't have to guess on that. Jesus tells us. The sea that this beast makes his way out of as he heads toward the great dragon so that they can find unity. It represents many peoples. This beast is going to be ruling over a lot of folks. He's going to be in control of a lot of things. I'm convinced that this beast, biblically, is a religious entity. Now, for years, there's been no religious entity that could bring this about. But that very soon will no longer be the case. We know that historically it was Herod, the ruler of Rome, that Satan used to have Jesus killed. Remember that? We know that later Satan used Pilate, a ruler of Rome, to make Jesus' crucifixion legally possible. He gave his stamp of approval so they could get her done. We know that Rome was involved. Eventually, political Rome will hand its authority over to a religious community. 
we've come to know that religious entity as the Catholic Church. And the Pope sits on the seat of power in Rome and has for many, many years. The Catholic Church used to be a worldwide power. But for many years now, it's lost that political clout. It used to be that if you disagreed with anything the Pope said, he could just have you killed. Remember back in the Dark Ages? If you want to translate a Bible that they don't want to translate, they just burn you at the stake. That's how it was. But it tells us that the beast seems to be mortally wounded when it comes to its ability to push folks around. You have to wonder if that's the case, what changed? How did things unfold to make all those things happen? Now, I think what happened is somebody put the whammies on the Catholic Church and the Pope, and I'll explain that in just a minute. But before I do, I want you to know, although right now the Catholic Church is somewhat quiet, it will not be that way as we enter the end times. We're going to see some changes. It will once again wreak havoc as we near the end of times. And it will wreak havoc in a different way than you've ever thought possible. Even now, it's reaching for worldwide religious domination by joining forces with Islam. The Catholic Church and Islam are uniting. That's a picture of the head of Islam and the Pope preparing to sign the paperwork to join the two organizations together and form a new religion called Chrislam. This is taking place as we're sitting here this morning. It's been under work for about 10 years now, and the paperwork was signed just a year or so ago to make it all happen. It is on the horizon. This new religion is being organized in Rome as we sit here today, and I believe we're seeing the religious beast so aptly described in Revelation rising to power as Chrislam comes to being. The beast received its authority, Chrislam received its authority, from the dragon, from the devil himself. Have you seen what happens whenever Islam wreaks havoc in a nation? They round up all the Christians. They put the little children inside of metal cages, put a fire under them and let them slowly roast to death. They behead them just a little at a time with knives. Remember all the orange vested people lined up along the ocean and they beheaded all of them? That is Islam. Islam is joining with the Catholic Church to form something called Chrislam. The beast standing in opposition to Jesus and his followers received a mouth to utter, to utter arrogant and, and blasphemy words. According to John 10, 33, to blaspheme is when a mere man makes himself out to be a god. Let's let one of the popes tell us what they believe about the papal position and the papal power. Pope Leo XIII declared, when speaking of popes, we hold on this earth the place of God. Wow, that is a bold statement. It sure seems to fit this beast and represent a political entity that could very well be exactly what we're talking about. Another act of blasphemy, according to Mark 2, 7, is anyone who claims that we can forgive sins without having the ability to do so. Well, that's blasphemy. Well, I can forgive your sins. Yeah, right. Only God can forgive sins. And yet, priests claim to have the ability to forgive people's sins. That's why they go to confession. I asked my good friend, Father Charles, he is a Catholic priest. We work together in the nursing homes. I asked him about this, and he explained that God himself has chosen to abide by the decision of the priest. If the priest says you're forgiven, then God forgives you. If the priest says you're not forgiven, then God doesn't forgive you. In essence, they put themselves in the place of God. It sure seems like men are claiming to have the ability to forgive sins, and thus they are blaspheming. It sure seems to fit this beast in its blasphemous ways. We're also told that this beast will persecute believers, and that's exactly what the Catholic Church did in its heyday during the dark and middle ages as it put hundreds and thousands of people to death. If you dared to step over the Pope's line, he simply had you eliminated. Because he had that kind of power. 
Now, I believe once Catholicism and Islam are fully united, the Pope under the banner of Chrislam will flex its muscles once again. I believe that with all my heart. When this union between Catholicism and Islam is complete, a new dimension will be added to the Catholic Church. They're going to bring some of Islam with it. You can't join two organizations without them both being affected. The Islamic belief that Jesus isn't God will become intertwined. As will the Muslims willingness to kill anyone that claims Jesus is God. It's coming, folks. I believe you can count on it. That means Chrislam will be the arch enemy of believers, both Jews and Gentiles. That means one day it will not surprise me if Chrislam comes through that door to shut us down. It will not surprise me if Chrislam comes after me for preaching the gospel of Jesus as the Son of God. Friends, in Chrislam, you get a pretty good match for the beast described here in the book of Revelation. This beast will be allowed to exercise its authority for 42 months. Now, the Catholic Church has been around for a while. In Bible prophecy, one day equals a year and 30 days account for a biblical month. So what this is saying is that this beast will wreak havoc for 1,260 years when you put all that together. 1,260 years. Mm, isn't it interesting that that's exactly how long the Catholic Church wielded its power before its impotence began? Isn't it interesting that we can read about the time that that impotence started? Napoleon put the whammies on the Catholic Church and its Pope and left the once great religious empire impotent. Remember Napoleon Bonaparte, the little guy that stuck his hand in his shirt all the time? That, that little fella, he gave the Catholic Church a seemingly mortal wound. But that beast is far from dead. It's far from dead. Napoleon may have had the Pope removed and allowed him to die in prison, but the Catholic Church is alive and well today, and so is Islam. Their union seems to be clearly on the horizon as Catholicism and Islam come together to create Chrislam. It is on the horizon. Don't miss it. Keep your eye on it, because that's going to play a big part, I think, in the end times. Once this union between Catholicism and Islam is complete and it comes to its full power, the Pope will once again make war on the saints in an effort to conquer them and make them follow whatever he says as God on earth. Now, I admit that's a bit disheartening to think that that's coming in our future. It's scary. What we've got to remember is that they can take our possessions they can take our jobs, they can take our life, but they can't take our eternity with God because he protects it. The beast authority and power will be wielded over the entire world. There's not going to be escaping this. It's going after true Christians wherever they are. There's not going to be any way to hide from Chrislam and the evil that it plans. <coughs> the beast that stands in opposition to Jesus and to Jesus' people has ten horns and seven heads. Ten diadems on its horn. Blasphemous names written on the heads. And it had a mortal wound on one of its heads. But the wound was healed. Something we've already discussed when Napoleon took the Pope out. As we said, it sure sounds like it could be the church in Rome. Who's now hard at work gaining world dominance. Through the amalgamation of Catholicism and Islam. Hmm. The beast will encourage people to worship the dragon. Who is? Satan. Satan. The beast says, yeah, I, I am Chrislam. I am the Pope. But the dragon, that's who we worship. We worship Satan. Are, are you starting to get the picture? Man, if anybody worships Satan, I, the Islam and the things they do makes me think it's them. People will marvel at the devil's demonic minions and their amazing power. And it's right here that I'm going to lose many of you. Because you're going to think I'm crazier than Looney Bug. And that's okay. I've been called crazy before. It won't be the first time. I think there's a good chance that the demonic minions or demons could very well be the creatures we often refer to as greys or ETs. Been around for centuries, been seen for centuries, been involved for centuries, been doing things to people. Been Now I know you think I'm crazy and that's okay. I, I told the men I would tell you it's just my belief system, but I think there's a good possibility that they've been plotting and planning and working for a long, long time to bring about the end time events. 
You don't laugh too loud. It really does make perfectly good sense. These demonic creatures seem to have technology far beyond ours. And people are somewhat terrified of them. I believe that their display of superior power could seem undefeatable to many human beings. I believe that if they came back and represented themselves as extraterrestrials, in spite of the fact that they're demons, fallen angels, I believe that they would have a whole lot of folks submit to their demands simply because they didn't feel like they could whoop them. Might as well bow down to them. We can't whoop them. See what they did? They called down fire from heaven. You see that? How can we deal with that? How can we fight against that? You may think that I'm absolutely crazy at this point in time, and that's okay. Time will tell. We'll see how it unfolds. We're told that mankind will see no way to stand against these minions of the beast, these demons or whatever they might be. Non-believers will simply bow the knee to them, but true Christians will not. They'll basically say, forget you, I'm standing with God. But their refusal to bow down and take a knee to this false religious authority, Chrislam and those minions that support it, will cause them to undergo horrible suffering. And I mean, it's going to be bad. They're going to lose their possessions. They won't be able to buy food or other necessities. Their ability to make a living will be removed. Many believers will die for their faith. Taking this solid stand, it calls for great endurance. And Revelation tells us that in 13, 9, and 10. It calls for great endurance. This is not going to be easy. The scene is pretty hopeless when it comes right down to it. In fact, in Revelation 13, 10, we read these words. If anyone is to be taken captive to captivity, he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword, he must be slain. Here's a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. In essence, God's going to let it happen. In other words, believers will be imprisoned, believers will be killed for their faith, and God's going to allow them to be killed. Their death will give them a chance to prove their eternal allegiance to Almighty God. And God makes it clear that they'll be richly rewarded for their bold stand. That brings us to the second beast that shows up here in this text. This one comes from the land. The beast out of the earth that John describes represents the false prophet who promotes the first beast and the dragon. This beast, it rises up from the earth instead of the sea. It had two horns like a lamb. It speaks like a dragon. Are you getting the picture of something creepy? It exercises all the authority of the first beast that came out of the sea. Remember that one? Uh, Chris Long, remember that? In essence, if you tick off one, you tick off all of them. And they'll come after you with all they are worth. This second beast forces the entire earth and its habits to worship the first beast, which I believe is Islam. And it performs great signs, making fire come down from the sky right in front of people. There's no denying it. Fire falls from heaven and consumes things. You talk about power. It forces people to build an image of the first beast. And it gives breath to the image so that it can speak. That's just plain creepy. Talking images, uh, it's just plain creepy. It seems to go way beyond simple parlor tricks. This seems to be satanic forces at work in the world as the end times approach. And that shouldn't surprise us since the dragon embodies the devil and he's been thrown to earth with his minions. The second beast causes everyone small and rich, great and poor, free and slave to receive a mark on their right hands and their foreheads so that they can buy and so that they can sell. You would have never thought that that could have happened 30 years ago. But friends, that's already the goal of the United Nations. They want to mark us all, to mark us and force us into submission. Folks, we need to wake up. We need to wake up. This whole COVID scare is pushing us ever closer to these events becoming a reality. They already have the chips that they can put in us. They already have the way to track us. They already have that. They tried to get it put into the COVID vaccine so that it could track us right now. It is on the horizon and it is possible today for all of these things to happen in a way that has never before been possible in the history of the earth. The image of the first beast causes all who refuse to worship the image to be slain. You don't bow down before this image, they're just going to kill you. The mark received by people is represented by the number of the beast's name. 666, 
standing for total imperfection. Total imperfection. And it's here that we leave our study. We'll pick it up when we get together again. We're going to close this morning with what we need to do if we want to go live with God forever. We need to surrender all. We need to surrender everything to him. Not some things, but all things. Yeah, this stuff is going to happen. I may not have it all right, but I'm pretty sure I've got some of it right. That being the case, we need to be prepared so that our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life and we can go live with God forever. We'll continue our study when we get together again. But for now, let's close by singing, I Surrender All. Oh, to him I could be.